This is Paul Heather and Friedman. Alejandro from Open Minds Magazine. Steve Austin. Don Lizard. Sylvia Richards. Michael Shred. Paul Kimball. Michael Cremo. Jesse Randolph of Youth and Radio and the New Guard. And, and you're listening, listening to the Youth and we're sitting here at the Modern Knowledge Tour with Richard Dolan, uh, author of a number of books, uh, a few of which are just seminal works, and I'm referring to UFOs in the National Security State, Volume 1 and 2, and the third is in the works to create the holy trinity of those historical documents. Uh, he's the author of A.D. with Bryce Zabel, After Disclosure, and most importantly, for it's perfect segue for what this tour is all about. This is uh, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. I think it's very poignant for the time that we live in, Richard, uh, when we're thinking about UFOs, and especially you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say this, that you know, the more you look into UFOs, the longer you look into it, you realize that there's many, many, many skins to the UFO phenomenon, and it's not just about nuts and bolts anymore. There's a level of consciousness, multi-dimensions, there's nuts and bolts, there's military black ops, but uh, I guess where we should start is uh, to say that your background, for those that don't know, is you did study U.S. history and, and, uh, and Europe as well, and that kind of transmuted in the 90s into your interest in UFOs. How exactly did that transpire yeah. from historian to UFOs? That's exactly right. I, um, well, a little over 20 years ago, I, had, I still had a vision that I would end up teaching at a university. I wanted to uh, uh, be a historian at, a, at some American university. and. Uh, work on <clears throat> European and or American history. Both of those were great loves of mine. I studied a lot of European history, a lot of German, a lot of Soviet studies, and then segued into uh, U.S. national security history. And all of that was a big part of my life through the 80s and into the 90s. Um, you know, in that type of an environment, they, they don't study flying saucers. It's just not done. But I, I got interested, and I've often uh, described this. It just became uh, an instant or near instant obsession of mine around 93, 94. Uh, and it was really, it, it, was, it started off as a simple little question. It didn't start out as a journey. At least I didn't think so. What was the catalyst? What happened? I, I, was, I was in a bookstore, and um, I saw a copy of Timothy Good's very classic Above Top Secret. One of and, my and, first books that I got as a kid. Absolutely. And it was the subtitle of that book that really got me, The Worldwide UFO Cover-Up. Yeah. And I thought, hello, what's this? <laughs> and I, I thought, really? Because it's a it big, was a fat tome, book. yeah. It's a large book. And uh, it, it put it together very well, of course. And in that book were um, references to, to individuals whose careers I had studied and departments that I had studied and documents that looked like they were certainly legitimate. That all testified to the reality of the UFO phenomenon and also to the seriousness which with, uh, with which people took it. And that was the thing that really caught my attention. My initial question was, interesting. I don't even care if they were right or wrong that the flying saucers were real. What I cared about is why did they think it was a significant thing and why was this not in any academic history book that I'd ever read? Why is that not interesting? Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 1950 when America is gearing up dealing with the Russians, you've got a nuclear secrets and then they've got concerns about flying saucers over nuclear installations. That's fascinating. And I, I thought I'll just take out a two or three months out of my life. That's it. To determine for my own satisfaction, I wasn't thinking to write a book, as to whether or not this was something. Because like everyone at some point has this question. I think every everyone out there at some point wonders, hmm, UFOs, is there something to it? And then we just sort of let it go and it, it, it drifts away into our life. But I didn't let it go. And of course, as many people before me and since have discovered, when you truly dive into this subject, it, it grabs a hold of you. So for me, I very quickly did determine that those uh, documents dealing with military interests were legitimate. Uh, they did detail a very strong interest in these, these objects. And then that led to a myriad other questions. Well, so what did they think about these objects? Did they have conclusions? Did they have theories? Did they ever stop being interested? Did they ever resolve this their own satisfaction? And it just turns out, they asked all the logical questions that you or I would ask. Were the Russians developing their own flying saucers? Did they have some revolutionary technology? Answer seemed to be no. Did we, the Americans, develop something? Answer seemed to be no. Seemed to be no. Yeah. And they. And so what you found in those early studies in the 40s and 50s were periodically American analysts would come to the conclusion that these, some of these were indeed possibly interplanetary. That was the phrase they liked to use. Yeah. And when you come to that conclusion, 
in the classified world. And then, of course, it gets batted down, and they, the group gets dispersed, but this happened periodically. I knew that I was on to something interesting. So that was the beginning. And, and as you were just uh, hinting before, and as I've really written about in this new book, the, the UFO subject, the phenomenon, uh, I think of it as a gateway or sometimes as a crowbar. Uh, it, it pries open that top layer of secrecy where there's all of this other stuff below, and everything seems to come out. Um, in the early years, I thought, well, I'll just study this very conservatively. I'll, I'll find out if this is a thing, if this is a phenomenon. Not getting into any uh, the crazy stuff like abductions or crop circles or cattle mutilations. I thought, that's, that's too crazy. Yeah. I'll just do UFOs. Yeah, too well, separate. It just doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, because it really all is of a piece. And then you were mentioning consciousness. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's a very legitimate way to, to, uh, the thing to study here because, first of all, uh, you have case after case of alleged encounters, but I think persuasive encounters, in my view, of people who believe that they've had encounters with these non-humans. And all of those communications seem to take place telepathically. Yeah. So right away, you've got something important relating to consciousness in uh, the subject of UFOs. So, so what, what you find is that this, this topic, the reason I wrote that book, it, it really is my attempt to do uh, justice to this field and provide a genuinely sophisticated overview of the subject for the for the novice and for the experienced yeah. person alike. This is the next level from where you were with UFOs in the National Security State. And after disclosure, which was a really fun read, I want to read just a quick quote from, from your book here in the introduction, because sure. uh, I think it sums up perfectly what you were just trying to say. And uh, in the book it says that you would say that a proper study of UFOs is a re revolutionary experience. Mm -hmm that shatters old belief systems and forces us to look at our world in a completely new way, where everything is affected. History, politics, economics, science, religion, culture, and ultimately the vision of who and what we are as human beings. And I think that's a perfect way to sum Thank up you. what this is all about. Thank you. And that really is my attempt. I think this is a subject that is deserves the attention of the finest minds that we have. It's that important. Uh, think, of, think of the science. Uh, one of my most uh, favorite parts of writing that book was a whole a chapter on crazy science as it intersects with UFOs. Um, you know, back in the 1950s, all of the, the things about this phenomenon just did not make sense to our scientists. How could an object loiter indefinitely and instantly accelerate? It didn't make any sense. Um, and, and for that reason, among others, scientists would, would dismiss UFO reports and say, well, it's just impossible. But what's happening is that our own science has been catching up to these reports. Um, one of those sciences is known as electrogravitics, and I think there's been enough work done on this to show that this is legitimate. And really, it's a science of what, for lack of a better word, we can call anti-gravity. Uh, and there's a lot of sophisticated work done. But there's other sciences that, as well that intersect with the, the phenomenon, uh, things like um, space-time. Uh, warp drive. I mean, there's there was a mathematician 20 years ago named Alcubier who developed a mathematically sound theory of, of what would be in Star Trek the warp drive. I remember when the article came out on the internet, I grabbed it and reported it right away. Yeah. This is my favorite part of the book, actually, uh, and of the lecture, because <clears throat> I try to look forward when I think about this phenomenon and where it's going to lead us and what we're going to become. Uh, Michael Tessarian, Tessarian was on there earlier live via Skype, and I asked him the question, uh, he was talking about the divine feminine and how it's sort of been kept secret from the world and their role yeah. and how it influenced the powerful kings and, uh, and monarchs in the world. Quite interesting, yeah. And I asked him a question. I said, do you think it's any coincidence that contemporarily the image of a female and male are both being shattered throughout the media, creating an ideal that's almost impossible to attain? And you're having an I thought that was a very good question, by the Thank way. Thank you. Yeah. And it culminated to the idea that you're finding a lot of the younger generations almost seeming kind of androgynous as an adverse effect, it almost seems as if it was engineered to produce a sort of the, an ideal of androgyny moving into the future, uh, uh, streamlining everything like they have with the New World Order, with the singularity, all of these, these ideas kind of coming together like we are. That's why I called the show The Unified Field, because it all seems to be sort of related on one level or another. And what I was thinking when I asked that question was you at dinner on Friday night talking about the idea, which ties into this chapter that I love on science, about the idea that one of the theories of who these beings are 
are an organic machine of some kind. Right, right. An androgynous mm -hmm. organic machine. What are your thoughts on that? I've been thinking about this quite a bit uh, for a number of years. And when I think of what these other beings can, are or can be, I think the most logical uh, likelihood is that they are artificially uh, created in one way or another. Now, when we talk about an artificial being, we, we tend to think of machines and mechanical things, but re really, look where we are with a few of our sciences, nanotech, uh, genetic engineering, artificial intelligence. Uh, how difficult would it be in another century, let's be conservative, 100 years from now, would, would, will we be able to create an artificial being that's partly organic, partly inorganic, uh, out of uh, advanced AI? That what what is what will life even be? Will we know how to define it? Mm -hmm. These are interesting questions, but it'll be this nebulous type of, um, but highly sophisticated type of creature. And I think when we're dealing with all of these reports that people talk about with greys or with reptoids or insectoids, it just seems to me a possibility that these are artificially created beings. Some of them created out of uh, native DNA of Earth. Right. After all, if we were beings from another planet, we wouldn't necessarily be able to walk easily around on the planet's surface. We might, though, uh, want to craft a native life form that uh, works for us. It's only, it's just an idea, Yeah. but who knows. Uh, relating to what your question, I just want to follow up and, and add, I think you mentioned Lady Gaga in some of those videos. And <clears throat> there really is a definite androgyny and, and a lot of uh, manipulation of sexuality in these videos. And when you, when you look at those types of megastars who are obviously taken and put into position by even higher elites who want them there, it seems to me that they are fulfilling an agenda. Yeah, an that's, a, an agenda. that's a perfect segue into one of my favorite aspects of your research and what you've said in a lot of your books. You coined the term breakaway civilization. And what we've just talked about, about bioengineering machines, uh, ties in just perfectly with that. I mean, there's no reason to believe that they're not already creating some of these technologies that we're dreaming about when we talk about like a dinner again and in the lecture right. you mentioned the processing power of 365 megahertz yeah, in six, 19, 650 650 um, in what year 1960 and, um, and yeah this is a conversation I had with a, a scientist who was a civilian scientist for NSA at that time who told me specifically and he this is a very reliable individual uh, I know him very well he's actually uh, rather famous and um, yeah, clock speeds of 650 megahertz in mid-1960s, which wasn't matched by the consumer market for 35 years, till around 2000. So you could say on that basis, NSA was 35 years ahead of the rest of the world. Where are they now? Uh, one question I ask, do they have quantum computing? Do they have what we would call strong AI? Where are they with genetic engineering and manipulation and nanotech? We don't know. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people do think that they've achieved quantum computing, and there have been hints dropped here and there that they may have done that. Uh, but in any case, this idea of a breakaway civilization, it did come to me about five years ago, uh, simply partly as triggered by that conversation that I had with this man, but also just thinking about the classified world and thinking about what it would be like if they'd had access to truly exotic technology, let's say in the form of a crash retrieval, um, being able to study things that the rest of us can't, and then classifying those breakthroughs, mm -hmm. which there are thousands of classified patents uh, that are preventing ordinary people from getting to that level. So if, they're, if they don't have those restrictions and they're able to keep going and going and building off of their own science, my feeling is that yes, they would have the opportunity to break far, far away yep. um, into a new realms of science, new cosmology, new, new understandings of who they are. That to me could be considered a separate civilization that's broken away from our own. I think it's really interesting to note too that <clears throat> from the 1960s to 2000, you're only talking about 35 years of hidden development. I mean, when you look at the idea of Moore's Law, that says that, uh, you know, processing power doubles every 18 months. Right. So, you know, just because they're 35 years advanced in 19, the, the 60s, how, how much farther are they advanced at this point Good from God. just 2000 to 14? Yeah. Uh, we could be talking five decades and we possibly wouldn't even be able to conceive the difference. And I think that's what a lot of these settings are now. This is a, this right. is a modern problem that we have. It's like, which one are theirs? which ones are ours. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it, are the, it, is there a connection between that and them? It's well, a huge it, question. It, it's, it's very complicated. I, I would never pretend that I have this solved. Yeah. Um, I do think that if, if someone were to see a, um, a perfect black triangle today instantly accelerate, it could be one of ours or not ours. Yeah. 
because actually there were excellent uh, silent black triangles being seen back in the 60s and 50s. We're, we're now finding out that the reports go way back. But um, one of the reasons I'm interested in some of the early reports, and I talked about a few of them here today at this event, uh, one from the 1920s, one from the 1930s here in, in Canada, in the Northwest Territories, that I found in the Canadian National Archives, were technologies that I don't believe were black budget creations. Um, I spoke earlier about a, an event seen by a, a Canadian um, was it, on an aerial mapping of the Northern uh, Territories of Canada in a, in a place called Islemer Lake in the Northwest Territories, where to this day there's just no one lives there. You, you can't live there and certainly not in 1936. He looks straight up in a perfectly blue sky and sees an elliptical shaped craft directly above him, shocked him. It turned from a north-south configuration to east-west instantly and ex uh, instantaneously accelerated and was gone. These are, the, these are the stories that really make me rethink the idea that, I mean, look, that guy was in the middle of nowhere, there was no one there and this thing shows up? Right. demonstrates its capabilities. There's, there definitely seems to be a correlation between consciousness and these events. I agree with you. You know, I had, uh, I didn't, I haven't mentioned this all the time, but occasionally I've talked about a sighting that I had uh, 15 years ago. I live in upstate New York in the city of Rochester. And in 1999, uh, I was with my son who was three years old at the time. I was holding his hand in front of my house, perfectly blue sky. I caught a bright glint of something in the sky and I thought, wow, that's the most reflective aircraft I've ever seen in my life. I don't see a shape. I wonder what that thing is. And I just stood there looking at it, looking and looking, and it was coming, it seemed to be coming slowly in my direction. But I couldn't, I couldn't make out a shape, and I was so intrigued by it. My poor son, who was three, was clamoring for my attention. I was trying <laughs> yeah. to be a good father, but I didn't, I, I thought if I look <clears> away <throat> from this, I'll never see it again. Why would I think that? No logic to that, because where could it go? Really? Right. But I, had, I knew that I was watching something strange. Eventually, my son got so upset that I had to turn for him for a moment, truly about one second, and I turned back and that thing was gone. And I, I left. I thought, come on, guys. And for the next five minutes, looked over the skies but found nothing. And I can't know what that was, but I've, I've had to continually wonder, was that there for me? I was nearly done with my first book on the UFO subject. I was deeply immersed in it at the time. I was breathing it. Uh, was that a little tap on my shoulder? Yeah. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to hold you here much longer, only because I think they were going to pack us up with everything yeah, else we're, here. Yeah, we're at the end here, aren't this we? This is the end. Um, you're going <laughs> to, this is awesome because you're a super rock star because you're going to go across the country in an RV with all well, these dudes. That part is true, yes. To all the major cities in Canada. Can Do you know who other, I know that you're going to be uh, speaking with Linda Moulton Howe in Toronto. Are there other guests that you're aware of that are coming up? Yeah, in fact, some of them are, are here and I'm really excited about them. Um, yeah, but, well, I and Michael Tellinger will be the, the two people who are going across the country from Halifax to Vancouver, cool. uh, doing 12 cities, I guess almost 4,000 miles, a lot of driving. Um, uh, Grant Cameron, my very good friend out in Winnipeg, will be one of those uh, speakers. And I think Grant's a wonderful researcher, Incredible. dealing with not just uh, U.S. presidency and UFOs, but he's really gotten into talking about UFOs and consciousness. It's yeah. become a very, very big interest of it. He has a lot to say about it. Yeah. Uh, my very good friend, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, will be in Toronto talking about uh, Gobekli Tepe, cool. uh, which I find fascinating. Uh, Stanton Friedman will be in, I believe, Fredericton. In, oh, Fredericton, Fredericton yes. yeah. And uh, he's, he's the doyen, the grand poobah of UFO <laughs> research. Uh, he'll be talking about Roswell, I'm sure, and MJ-12 and whatever else he wants to talk about. Uh, Kerry Cassidy will be in uh, Ottawa or Montreal, I think Ottawa. The highly controversial Kerry Cassidy. Oh, well, I've, I've known Kerry for about a decade and uh, I love her. I think she's... Uh, she she's seems a, lovely. She's, she's a, a good and very, very intelligent person. Cool. Uh, you know, Ker Carrie has done a lot to um, raise awareness of this whole subject. She's done great interviews with Project Camelot. A lot of controversial interviews, for sure. For sure. I mean, I, I would have issues with some of them, but I, I really... Whoops. But I really, really admire what she's done over the years, and she's done some fantastic interviews cool. with some fascinating people. I think very good work. So she'll be there. Um, Dr. Carmen Bolcher. Some of these folks I, I'm not as familiar with. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, we have got experts on GMOs cool. who'll be talking. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of other, basically, you could say GMOs to UFOs and everything in between awesome. from Halifax to Vancouver. So you've always, just one last question. You've always got something on the cooker. 
<clears throat> I mean, you're, yeah. I know you're working on the the final ver the final uh, edition for the trilogy of your UFOs and National Security yes. State. Is there anything coming up in your future, maybe outside of books, that you've got planned for the upcoming year? Well, I've, I'm doing two things uh, with this subject. I'm writing books and I'm publishing books. So I have a small company. It's, it's growing. It's called Richard Dolan Press. And I'm publishing uh, simultaneously right now three books by other authors. I'm trying wow. to get those done. One by Dr. Bruce Maccabee, very nice. well-known researcher. Mm -hmm. Excellent book. Um, on UFOs, FBI, and CIA, and it's it's outstanding. I've been going through it myself. Uh, a book by Paul Stonehill and Philip Mantle on Soviet slash Russian USOs, uh, and a book by a, a lesser known woman, but fascinating woman named Lori McDonald, who um, is more like if your if your house is haunted, what's going on, and how to deal with it. And I, I don't normally deal with that aspect of the paranormal, but she's written a very fine book, and I think it's worthy of publishing. I'm happy to do it. So I'm doing publishing projects by interesting authors that are really pushing the boundaries. Uh, other things that I do, and there's always a video and radio and, and some TV interviews that, and things yeah, like that. That's that I what do. I was going to say. Talking about Trinities, you, you do have your own radio show. What's that called? Right. It's called The Richard Dolan Show. Uh, I've been doing it now for a little over two years. Uh, it's, it's been a nice little ride there. I do it on uh, KGRA Radio. It's on the web. You can just look it up. It's a uh, live feed every Monday night uh, from 9 to 11 Eastern. And I would encourage you to, to go check in. Normally, it's just me doing my thing. I, I don't often need a guest. I feel like I'm the I'm a non assholeish version of Rush Limbaugh for UFOs. That's really what I try to do. People will just tune in because you're Richard Dolan. That's well, the that's bonus. nice to hear. I hope so. But um, I I'll often just do my own thing. But I'll have guests on, and I, I enjoy interviewing people who have got interesting things to say. Well, you have coined the term breakaway civilization. Now I'm going to coin a term. You're my favorite anarchist cognonaut. I love that phrase. Thank you, because you're a dissident like I am. I Come on, you're that. in you're in the UFO Anarchist world. Anarchist cognonaut. I've got to remember that. <laughs> I'll give you credit when I when I use it. Thanks a lot for your time and good luck on the tour. It was my pleasure, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you very much.